to this Melbourne Writers Festival event in conversation with Julia Gillard. Now, this event is being held in partnership with the Wheeler Centre and we thank them, of course, for their cooperation. Before I welcome our guest, who everybody knows, let's be honest, today, I just want to respectfully acknowledge that today I'm meeting, of course you could be watching from anywhere, but I'm meeting on the lands of the Kulin Nation and in particular, I want to respect the Wurundjeri and Woonwurrung people and pay my respect to the elders, past, present, emerging and future. And I know that's sort of something we often uh, begin every conversation with, but I do think it's really important to think about the long history of this land and its long, long uh, ties uh, with our current identity as well, sort of to constantly have a sort of that in our thoughts as we have these sorts of conversations. My name is Patricia Cardell, so I'm an ABC host. I'm also a former political correspondent. In fact, I'm very excited to be speaking with Julia Gillard. When I was young and learning about politics, I think I followed her around on an election campaign or two or when she was deputy leader or even when she was in opposition, I followed her career closely and, of course, watched her emerge um, to the heights that she did, our first female prime minister. She is a household name. She's not someone you really have to try very hard to introduce, which makes my job easier as well. She was sworn in as the 27th Prime Minister of Australia, our first and only ever female Prime Minister, which is something I think about quite a lot when I think about the history of this country and leadership in this country. And not only has she done that, now she's written a book about women and leadership. Uh, it's actually called that, Women in Leadership. She's co-authored the book and she's our guest today. Julia Gillard, welcome. Hi, Patricia. Great to be with you. Now, this book couldn't have been written by a more perfect person, Mike, because it's at, you're actually an expert on its title. So <laughs> congratulations for actually knowing what you're writing about. Um, before I do anything else, I'm going to do something a bit weird, but I'm, I'm like that. I, I actually want to start the conversation by acknowledging that uh, it's kind of an apology of sorts because I think journalists like me watched the revolting sexist treatment that you endured when you were Prime Minister with a sense of disbelief and confusion about how to deal with it. And it's only now that the years have gone on that you're able to talk about it, but also that female journalists like me are able to talk about it and say what we what we witnessed was wrong and also what was wrong was that we didn't speak up more. So I know that's weird, but I really apologise for not being more active in saying this is kind of disgusting. That's partly part of the conversation in your book too. That's what you wanted us all to talk about, right? It is what I wanted us to talk about. I'm not really in the business of looking for apologies, though thank you for saying that. That's very generous of you. But I did want people to reflect on not just my time in office, but we interview eight fantastic women leaders from around the world. And doing that helps you get a sense of what's the gendered bit. You know, when you're looking in your own country, obviously the politics of the time, the personalities loom large, and it's quite hard to disaggregate what was the gendered bit. Whereas if you're interviewing women from around the world and comparing all of those experiences, it can be clearer to see what is different solely because they're women. And one of the things that they do reflect upon is that sometimes, and Theresa May, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, says this very clearly, sometimes they felt um, under attack from the media because they were women, that the imagery was very gendered, and that even though they knew female journalists were feminists and very strident about women and leadership, they didn't feel particularly supported by them. And Theresa May went on to muse that that was probably part of the phenomenon where a woman journalist going off to interview a woman leader is kind of getting razzed up in the office to say, don't you go soft on her just because of your sisterhood stuff. Don't you give her a free pass. You're a political journo. So, you know, go in for the hard yards. Um, and perhaps women journalists take that on board to an extra level because they are still trying to credential themselves in what has traditionally been a very male world. When you wrote this book, I want to zoom out, what did you think or who did you think your audience was? Obviously, any author wants everyone to be their audience and, and hopefully everyone will be. The book's available, Melbourne Writers Festival, Bookshop, if you want to look it up right now. 
So everyone is your audience. But who are you writing it for? I kind of kept in my mind's eye a couple of different readers when I was writing it. Um, obviously women, and I was thinking of young women in particular who might still be thinking about their career paths and wondering, should I go for it? What could it mean for me if I sought to excel and lead, not just in politics, but in any walk of life? Then staying with women, I also thought of women who are mid or upper career range, who actually have the power to make a difference and are thinking a great deal about the next generation and what they can do to help them come through. But I also wanted an audience to be corporate leaders, disproportionately men, uh, but people who really do um, have a lot of influence and can bring a lot of change if they choose to. And I always understood that because I'm authoring it and it includes the lives of women politicians uh, and my co-author, Dr Ngozi Akonjiri wheeler also comes from the world of politics in the sense that she served as Nigeria's foreign minister and finance minister, that the political aficionados would be after it as well. Your book finds that women leaders are heavily judged for their appearance. Now, you know, that's obvious that anyone, I think, on earth, and if anyone wants to contest it, well, would luck to you because I think there's a really strong body of evidence to prove it. What I found interesting, though, is that it's universal uh, and that it is, you know, there are no exceptions. You could find no exceptions to this rule. Like there wasn't even one great study. It's happened everywhere. Tell me about the different ways it works around the world and what you discovered through these various interviews. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, Clinton, of course, you spoke with Jacinda Ardern. How does it play out differently across the world? One of the theories that we were pursuing with this book was how much of sexism and attitude to women leaders is about culture and context and how much of it is universal. You know, is sexism, well, I, I believe sexism is a global phenomenon, but is its various manifestations, are they also globalised or are they quite different in different parts of the world? And I hope one of the delights of this book is that it brings to the audience stories that they may not have heard of quite so much as they've heard of Jacinda Ardern's story or Hillary Clinton's story. So there are two African women in it, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first woman to lead a nation in Africa, Joyce Bander, the second woman to lead a nation in Africa. They led Liberia and Malawi, respectively, and Michelle Bachelet from Chile, the first woman to lead there. And even coming from such different contexts and cultures, you know, New Zealand, the US, the UK, Africa, Liberia, Malawi, Chile, they all report that they felt this disproportionate focus on their appearance. And many of them used the same tools to solve it, which was to try and adopt a standard look. So they didn't look very different each day to try and close down the commentary about what they were wearing. But the expressions of that were different. So for women in Western contexts, it tended to be sort of a business look. But for our two African leaders, it was traditional dress. And then they were inviting people to take a pride in the fact that as African women, they were wearing African dress on the world stage. What did they tell you about the kind of effect that had on their own, the way that they viewed themselves as leaders or, or how much it took up of what I kind of think of as brain space? I mean, I know I work in television as well. The amount of time it takes and the effort and the, just the thinking about it, it's very boring and tiring. I mean, how distracting was it to be the actual work that they, that they were there for? I think, Patricia, you could have a fantastic conversation with Hillary Clinton because she would use almost exactly the same words you're using. She talks in the book about how she added up uh, the amount of time that she spent in hair and makeup each day when she was campaigning for the 2016 election to be President of the United States. And it equaled 24 days. Now, 24 days so that she was looking her standard pantsuit Hillary Clinton look. You know, she wasn't busting out a, um, you know, ball gown every day. Uh, and you compare the, the candidate against her, you know, I don't think anybody in the world would think that Donald 
Donald Trump spent a whole lot of time uh, getting ready for his presentations in his suit and with his quite unique hairstyle. And so she very much resented it. And most of the women we interviewed didn't resent it quite that much, but identified it as a problem to be solved, you know, and energy that they wish wasn't being taken in that direction so that they could put it elsewhere. But there was one woman who was quite different to that, Theresa May. She's been interested in fashion all her life. It's a recreation, her hobby. It's what she does to decompress, uh, looks at fashion magazines and the like. And she told a very positive story about being in a lift at the House of Commons and getting into a conversation with the young woman in the lift around shoes because she admired the pair of shoes the woman was wearing. And the woman said, look, I'm in politics because of your shoes, you know, when the media started reporting what Theresa May was wearing, this young woman took an interest in the fashion that led her to be interested in Theresa May, that led her to be interested in politics and there she was with a job in the House of Commons. So it is possible for these things to have a positive side but overwhelmingly the leaders sort of thought about it as an energy taking thing. What I love about this book, and it's a fantastic book, is the diversity of the women you talk to, but the kind of way that you test theory with practice and, and cross-examine the way that plays out. I want to talk about Jacinda Ardern and some of the comments she made. The hijab, of course, that she wore, which, uh, you know, when we talk about, well, I'm not going to call that fashion, but the way that she tried to show a, a softer side or an empathetic side to leadership. How powerful can the way representation work for a leader? I mean, how important is that also about the way that you present yourself to identify with, of course, in this case, a vulnerable community? Jacinda in the book talks about the decision to wear the scarf that day and it was a very intuitive, you know, I'm going to be with a community that's grieving, I want to show solidarity, I want to show respect and so uh, what they, the women there will be wearing, I will wear and so she wore the scarf and I think it but combined with her actions that day are what spoke volumes about empathy and solidarity not that she was just wearing a scarf but as she wore it the way in which she interacted with that community it reinforced in a visual sense the message she was giving New Zealand and the world which is that an attack on any one of us is an attack on all of us and we're not going to uh, succumb to stigmatise a community or pretending that they're different from the rest of us as human beings. So that was certainly a day on which um, what a woman was wearing actually spoke volumes about empathy, resilience and reaching out. Jacinda Ardern also said something to you in this book which I want to say I felt really troubled by. I still feel troubled by. So I'm, I'm, this is like a therapy session if you can help me. Um, where she says that if she, you know, wants to be in politics in Australia, she's not sure because of our media and our system that things would have turned out quite the same way. Of course it disturbed me because I'm an Australian and I'd like to see more women in leadership positions in this country. So if that's her observation as a leader in our sister nation in some ways, our cousins down the road, that's, that's not helpful to us. What kind of reaction did you have? And do you agree with her assessment? Yeah, I was uh, quite taken aback by that too. I mean, we were talking uh, in New Zealand. I'd gone to Wellington. I was meeting her on a Saturday morning. Uh, Ngozi was actually on the phone for that interview, uh, New Zealand being quite a long way away <laughs> from where Ngozi is. Um, so, you know, it was a very uh, casual uh, sort of chat and Jacinda is a very open person. So, you know, baby Neve was coming and going with Jacinda's mum and dad. So I felt like I was in in the middle of uh, Saturday uh, morning tea as she was taking a little bit of time after what was a big week around the New Zealand budget. And she did make that observation that she described my experience as brutal 
And she says if she been an Australian, she's not sure that in an environment like that she would have put herself forward. And that did kind of take me aback too. I mean, you always want to be so proud of your nation and I am very proud of Australia, but I could understand what she was saying. And ultimately, as I mused about it later, it left me with some sense of um, confidence and ability to change things over time because what has made a difference for her in New Zealand, she's very clear about this, is that it's different to be the third than be the first. So Jenny Shipley, then the very long prime ministership of Helen Clark, and now Jacinda Ardern. You know, New Zealand's one of two nations in the world that have been led by a woman three times. The other one's Iceland. And it just shows that if you can get there where women are more and more routine as leaders, then some of the things that put women off will diminish. She did also point to a more benign media environment. And I think we're all aware uh, that we've got a very concentrated media market here in Australia with uh, the ability to be uh, quite hard hitting and quite hard hitting in, um, you know, I mean, to in my view, frankly, for bias come to the to come to the fore, and when it comes to the fore, for it to come to the fore across a highly concentrated group, and so then it's almost everywhere in the Australian media. Seventy percent of countries haven't had a woman leader. Quite a big chunk of the world. Like when you think about that figure, it's staggering. Um, it's twenty twenty. How did we get here? Because growing up as a young girl in Australia, I kind of thought feminism had happened. Now I've got to sort of middle age and I have young girls and it's my assessment that we couldn't be any further in some ways. It feels like it's very distant to reach the sort of goal of gender equity. What's going wrong? Well, it's interesting you would say as a young woman you thought feminism had happened. Uh, when I was a young woman, I thought feminism was happening, but it was happening really quickly. <laughs> and so I, I kind of made a very happy assumption as a young woman too, uh, which was that by the time I was, you know, mid-career, say in my 40s, that all of this had been done and dusted and there'd be no differential treatment anymore. Everybody had been treated the same. Uh, I was wrong. You were wrong. The rate of change is much slower than either of us would like. And I I don't want to underestimate how much has been achieved. I mean, the very fact I've been Prime Minister, the fact that you can be uh, a senior woman in journalism, I mean, all of this shows that things are changing but it's at the rate of change that's truly troubling. And I think we're in that really sticky, stubborn middle bit now where there's structural changes still to do to enable women to come forward more easily for leadership, but there's also a whole lot of psychological stereotyping that's in all of our brains that we've got to get out of our brains. And that requires a very deliberate thought process. It's a body of work for everyone. Because um, often when we talk about feminism, people think, well, that's a, an argument that a whole lot of men need to change. Actually, I think the central argument of this book is that we've all got to change because those sexist whispers are in all of our brains. I love the way you just said that. They are sexist whispers and, they, and they're, you know, they're ingrained. You also challenge the idea in this very strongly, this idea of an inherent female style of leadership. I'm glad to see it through the interviews and through the arguments you make you challenge this idea that a woman leads in a more compassionate, um, female way because it is premised on sexism itself, which is not very useful to us. But at the same time, and there are contradictions that I want to sort of explore with you here, we do think we want more women in, in leadership and that's because we do think women can bring something else to it. How do we tread that very nuanced line that women can be different kind of leaders but equally that there is nothing inherently different? 
Well, I'm indebted uh, to a wonderful academic, a woman called Cordelia Fine at the University of Melbourne uh, for the neuroscience bit in the book. Uh, and we use her research to debunk the sort of men are from Mars, women are from Venus sort of analysis, which she beautifully describes as neurosexism, not neuroscience. So there aren't inherent differences in men and women's brains, which mean, you know, women are inherently more nurturing and men are inherently more commanding. I think where um, we see differences is twofold. One, women and men have been socialised differently and so different traits have been praised and rewarded and, you know, the boy in the playground who can be organising all the other kids might be identified as a natural leader. The girl doing that is seen as a Miss Bossy Boots. So we send cues very easy, early to kids about, um, you know, if they're going to lead, what kind of permission they've got to do that and what sort of style they should be doing that in. So I think, you know, women take that on board and that's one reason why women as leaders are more empathetic and nurturing. But I think the second reason is because the research shows we pay out on women leaders who look like they have given away all of the classic traits that we associate with the feminine. So if you've got a command and control, rough and tumble, never take a prisoner kind of female leader, people will conclude she's unlikable, she's bitchy, she's prickly, she's not the kind of person you want to know. And in democratic politics, she's not the kind of person you want to support. And you don't have to be a reader of all the gender research to get to that conclusion. I think women intuitively know it, uh, which means that the women who tend to prosper best as leaders are women who have successfully combined strength and e empathy. And I think that's a good thing because I think strength and empathy is a great style of leadership. But if we're saying that's the style of leadership we want to see, then we need to ask that of everyone who puts themselves forward for leadership, men and women, not just require it of the women. Let's talk about the sort of female body, the reproductive uh, lens that's put on women, because this is a big theme of the book as well. And of course, we all, you know, know that famous fruit bowl um, controversy in your life where you didn't have fruit in your bowl and that was that you demonstrated you didn't understand how to be a human. Although I always found that weird because even if you're a single woman without children, I imagine you like fruit still. Fruit's quite likable for anyone. So Strange moment, but we lived through it. We endured the fruit gate moment. But the notion of, of choosing not to have children and the way that triggers people, right? And it does. And the way that triggered people when you were leader. Uh, I want you to reflect if you can. And I am, I know you've written about other women leaders and asked them questions, but of course, you're our first and only female prime minister. So I, I'm interested in you. Apologies. <laughs> Tell me about that and and the way you saw that you know discomfort and what that demonstrates about how we understand the role of women when you choose not to have children and you make the comparison with of course Theresa May and her choice for not having children they were different sort of treatment that you both got. Well, first, I feel the need, Patricia, to clarify, I do like fruit. I do eat fruit. Um, I, uh, I just come over. Just clarify for anyone watching, like, what's your favourite fruit? If you could have any. Oh, look, I would be a toss up for me. Uh, you know, I like uh, bananas. I'm a banana eater. I'm a pear eater. I'm a apple eater. All of the above. <laughs> Stone fruit hey, in season. It's amazing. It's just amazing. <laughs> You don't have to have kids to eat fruit, revelation. Um, yeah. But more seriously, we do delve into all of this. Um, you know, we have a chapter in the book that's entitled Who's Minding the Kids? And we talk to uh, women leaders who have children about that struggle juggle of work and family life. And obviously Jacinda Ardern is the main person there because she's the second woman in the world to combine uh, being a democratic leader and having a baby. The uh, first was Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan. Pakistan. Um, but it also records my experiences and Theresa May's experiences. We're both childless. 
And there's a big difference in our experiences, which is Theresa May and her husband wanted to have children but were unable to do so. And so she says in the book that overwhelmingly by the community and by the press that's been treated with a, a sense of respect and sensitivity. And yet even with all of that background, when she put herself forward to lead the Conservative Party and was facing up to a ballot, David Cameron having resigned, uh, a principal candidate against her was another woman who did a media interview basically saying that because she was a mother and was going to be a grandmother and therefore had a stake in the future, she would be a better leader than Theresa May. And that interview caused so much backlash that the candidate against Theresa May pulled out and she became a leader of the Tory party uncontested. So, you know, even in an environment where she would have said across most of her life, the issue had never been treated in a politicised way at the ultimate moment when she's putting herself forward to be the prime minister, it comes to the fore. Uh, for me, it came to the fore in all different sorts of ways because I think there is more suspicion uh, if women have lived lives and, and chosen not to have children, which is my story. There's a um, looking at women like that, that, you know, we've, we've got all of the old, might be slightly dated language now, but the language that used to get used of, you know, oh, you're a career girl, you know, you're putting... Um, putting, uh, climbing up that ladder uh, above being a nurturer and a carer and a mother. And that does then, I think, trigger a set of questions in all of us about who this woman is. And it is incredibly gendered because we don't transpose that onto men and we don't transpose the questioning about work and family life onto men either. I know that from my own political experience where women with kids in parliament would often get asked around, you know, how are you are managing it all? Whereas men with children of exactly the same age range never got asked because there's just this assumption that there's someone at home who is making all of this possible for them. So a very gendered differential very hard to get the right answer to that question. Do you have children if you're in politics or at high levels of leadership? If you do, that's seen as a problem. If you don't, that's seen as a problem. And how much did you think about how to answer that question? Me in my own life or, yeah. yeah oh, how, I, in terms of the way it would be received, not your own feelings, but how oh, right. better manage the gender. Yeah, I mean, it... It's just one of those, I mean, one of those things where, you know, you can just explain your life the way you've lived it and people can accept it or not accept it. I mean, there's nothing you can do. I mean, I, um, I used to sometimes resent the terminology oh, you don't have a family. I mean, I do have a family, you know. I, um, I uh, you know, yes, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not a mother, I've never been a mother, but that doesn't mean uh, that I haven't got all sorts of family bonds and family ties that are incredibly important to me. So that used to irritate me a bit. Yeah, and, and the idea of, of that experience, meaning that you understand more about formulating policy is also key. What I find really interesting about that is, you know, we are in a culture that's increasingly questioning, not particularly some of the, the harder right, the concept of identity politics, and yet identity politics get played out very strongly when it comes to women and parenting, that you have to have experienced having children to really understand, I don't know, how to construct a childcare policy. Uh, how, how much does sexism underlie the way we think about those things, women in politics and what experiences they had to have had when we don't put those layers onto other decision-making, the fact that mainly white men are making all sorts of policies that affect poor people and, you know, we don't, we don't have that same lens about other things. Yeah, we don't and I think there's... Um there's a stage here which we easily slip into, including those of us who are advocates for more women in politics, which is, you know, the, the foundation stone for me as to why there should be more women leading politics, civil society, the judiciary, business, you name it, um, news media. Uh, the, the reason there should be more women is merit is equally distributed between the sexes. 
everyone's got the right to, you know, uh, live their life without artificial barriers being put on in their way on the basis of gender or indeed any other characteristic uh, race and the list goes on. And so it's in everyone's interest to clear those unfair barriers out of the way so that people can come through. And if they're coming through on merit, then that will inherently give you a diverse group of leaders because merit is equally distributed. I think we often then feel the need to put the second argument. And so we construct the second argument. And, you know, without women at the table, there's a whole lot of life's experience that won't be brought into decision making. And I think that's practically true. And the evidence does show that when there are more women in politics, it's more likely that issues like childcare and gender-based violence and the like will be the subject of policies. Doesn't mean that a man can't enter politics and say, you know, the one thing I want to do with my political career is make a difference about domestic violence or the one thing I want to do is make a difference about childcare. A man could do that, but the evidence shows that it's women who tend to bring those issues to the fore. So I, I do think that, yes, the reason diversity has an extra benefit is because you get the benefit of uh, different perspectives on life. But, but we shouldn't lose the foundation stone. The foundation stone is that it's morally right. And if a woman went into politics saying, um, I'm a command and control leader, uh, I, I always, you know, I'm prepared to stomp on toes and push people out of the way to get the job done. Uh, the thing that I'm most interested in is reforming the military. Um, that shouldn't somehow be viewed as illegitimate or uh, objectionable. But the truth is, in today's Australia and today's world, that would be that would be viewed as very, very odd. When it comes to Angela Merkel, what is it about the way she's led that is different to, or why has it been successful? What, what, what What's your analysis of how that worked? I think she is a different style of female leader compared with some of the conversation we've had so far. You know, if you look, um, if you look at this era of the pandemic and people have been saying, look, the leaders who are doing the best are women leaders, they combine strength and empathy, and then you'll see a meme go around on social media and it's got, uh, you know, Jacinda Ardern's face on it and it will have Angela Merkel's face on it and as well as women leaders from other countries, Norway and I land and so forth. Um, in truth, though, I think they're very different people and they're very different leaders. I mean, what uh, Angela Merkel has brought to the fore uh, time and time again, and she's doing it now in the pandemic, is a very, she's a very scientific, precise, evidence-based person. And I think she's become respected for that. Jacinda, for, in contrast, um, has wanted to foreground kindness and empathy as the watchwords of her leadership. Uh, and I think if you look at other female leaders at this stage, Erna Solberg of Norway, uh, who we interview in the book, she's probably somewhere halfway in between those two models. She does like to exhibit kindness and so she famously did that question and answer session with school children who were worried about the pandemic but she also is quite a precise um, and uh, you know a rigorous sort of policy kind of person um, so not the not necessarily encompassing the warmth that we associate with Jacinda Ardern's public engagements uh, though she of course has a fine mind too so it's just telling you women can be leaders in different ways. I do wonder whether in a different cultural context, uh, Chancellor Merkel's leadership would be as embraced as it's been by the people of Germany. Um, you know, she's someone who quickly closed down appearance questions by, you know, getting a very standard look. Um, she's obviously not someone who uh, cares about, you know, fashions or anything like that as they come and go. She does have this quite precise kind of style. I wonder if in a different cultural context that would be viewed as a bit too hard-edged. Uh, yes, and I think the other part of that is I want to explore with you how you got these women on the record. Uh, which, you know, okay, Angela didn't speak, but we want her to speak, right? You'd love her to speak. At some yes. point she's going to speak. But the other women you did get on the record, and there's quite a lot of them, 
was the fact that, I mean, you, you know, blow your own trumpet, Julia, was the fact that you have been a woman leader really useful in that effort where they felt like they could trust you and you could talk authoritatively with them or at least share experience about leadership? Uh, I think, yeah, in terms of getting, you know, eight amazing women leaders on the record, I mean, the fact that uh, Ngozi and I were writing this book, I think, was interesting to them because uh, depending on where they were in the world, they were familiar with one of us or the other one of us or both of us. You know, a number of those leaders would know Ngozi far more than they would know me, for example, and then, you know, leaders like uh, Jacinda would know me far more than Ngozi. Um, so... Uh, the the fact that we were writing it and we were writing it in combination, I think, interested people. But we structured it so that it gave them some protective factors. And what I mean by that is if an individual woman leader uh, does an interview or makes a statement about gender and politics, that will often be derided as... Um, self-serving, she's trying to distract from X or Y or Z political problem in her own nation, um, she's starting a gender war, she's playing a gender card, you know, all of those things will come out. Whereas if you can say to women leaders, we're going to interview you, we're going to interview seven others, we're going to put exactly the same questions to each of you, it gives them the protection that when it all comes out, it won't just be about them, but actually it will be about what's in common um, and what isn't in common across this group of leaders. So I think that changes the backlash dynamic and they understood that. Um, you write in the book, um, sorry, I'm just getting my highlighter bit out, uh, that... <laughs> I love the good highlighter in the book. <laughs> Here it is, it's a yellow one. I prefer pink usually. Um, that when you were deciding to co-write the books, there was there were lots of disagreements, not a sort of negative word, but lots of disagreements. And I love that idea um, of kind of challenging each other if you're, you know, not groupthink basically, the idea of challenge. What was the most challenging? Was it the concept of or the experience of maybe having a more sort of Anglo-prism uh, view versus uh, understanding Africa? Was it that kind of cultural difference that you found was profound or was it also ideological? It was um, It was a bit both. I, I wouldn't quite use the word ideological. Certainly there was, there was the cultural differences and, um, you know, working with Ngozi enabled me to um, understand and to think differently about a number of the things we said in the book about race. And we were very conscious that we weren't interviewing a, a woman who was a sort of a Barack Obama figure. There's none of these women, uh, women who ran for democratic politics in a nation where they themselves weren't a representative of the chief, um, you know, race in the nation or ethnicity. Uh, so, you know, obviously Ngozi herself is a black woman, as are Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Joyce Bander, but they were served their political leadership in countries uh, in Africa that have predominantly black populations. But once they stepped outside into international meetings, all of them uh, recounted the sort of double burdens, the intersection between gender and race and being not only discounted because they were a woman, but discounted because they were a woman of colour. And, you know, I couldn't have written about that uh, without Ngozi's um, guidance and insights. I simply didn't see it the way she sees it. And so the book is immeasurably strengthened by that. Um, and then whilst we have different political views, um, I wouldn't say ideological uh, tensions, but, you know, we do test a variety of hypotheses about women and leadership and we had to wrestle them to the ground to see whether or not we could crisply put the hypothesis and we agreed on it, and that took a fair bit of back and forth. Was there any idea that you walked in with or, or that you've held that you found was challenged by the evidence and the women that you spoke to that you thought, well, I've always thought this, but perhaps I haven't got that quite right? Yeah, two things. I did think that 
culture and context would make more of a difference than it ultimately did. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to overput that. I've always um, sort of tossed my head when, um, you know, Western feminists, um, Australian feminists are met with the argument, you know, what on earth have you got to complain about? You know, there are countries in the world where girls don't get educated and there's, you know, uh, female genital mutilation and child marriage and on and on the list goes. So what on earth are you complaining about? I've, I've never uh, succumbed to any of that and I note that none of those arguments are ever used against men uh, who complain about things. No one ever turns around to a man and says you've got no right to complain until the poorest man on the planet is leading a good life. Um, but even having not succumbed to those arguments, I did think culture and context would speak more profoundly than ultimately it did in the book. The second thing that surprised me, which was a research insight rather than an interview insight, I intuitively thought that, and I had seen some of the research about how um, we easily um, look at a woman leader and conclude that she's not likeable, but I was taken aback by some of the research that showed just how strong and rejecting the emotions can be for a woman who is um, showing power and agency in her own right. There's a, you would have seen a piece of research from Yale in the book where they get, you know, two audiences, two groups of voters, get a man to pitch as a candidate to one audience, a woman to pitch to the other audience. They're pretending they're running for the Senate. Um, they use exactly the same script and it's got, you know, lines in it are like, you know, pushing through and stepping on toes but getting the job done. And for the man, that's fine. And for the woman, the researchers use words like contempt and revulsion to describe the dimension of the reaction. That took me aback. There's my, my favourite part, and I'm three-quarters through or maybe half, uh, is the way you give lessons at the end. I'm a practical person, I'm a journalist, so, you know, I like things boiled down. So thanks for that. Um, <laughs> lots of lessons about how to do it, some really smart ones. They're sad, but including expect sexism rather than, you know, I'm hoping that it's a utopian situation. Expect to be scrutinised for the way you look. Have answers on all of this. But one thing that I've highlighted as well is um, this idea of scarcity right, the scarcity and the way that women think of the way that, you know, that there's only a certain number of spots. I know this has been dealt with before, but I still see it in every part of the workplace, not just in politics. Explore with me what you mean around scarcity and how women should think differently about this. Yeah, we uh, picked up, it's a quote actually, a wonderful quote about the politics of scarcity uh, and the conclusion that as women, it isn't our fault, but it is our problem. And this, you know, I mean, I think if you, you know, got a group of people, group of women or a mixed group, women and men talking about um, feminism and the women's movement and you said, look, you're in an entirely safe space here, you can say whatever's on your mind, whatever you're thinking, inevitably someone would say, look, the problem with all of this is, you know, the worst enemy for women is often other women. And, you know, men might say, look, we're trying to do what we can to help. But, you know, in my workplace, this happened and one woman went up against another woman. And honestly, it was ugly. I thought they were going to scratch each other's eyes out, you know. So everybody would have a cat fight style story. And many of the women would have a story about when they weren't supported by another woman. Woman. So we look all at we try and look all of that as complicated as it is in the face. And one of the things we come out of that talking about is the politics of scarcity. So, you know, as the women's movement has won some advances, we we've got to the stage where if you look at a federal cabinet or a cabinet in a state government or a corporate board or a class of senior journalists or a class of senior managers, you will probably see a number of women, but they're not half yet. So they might be 10%, 20%, 30%, something like that. And it can be quite easy for women to therefore get it in their head that my way through is to take one of the women's spots 
off the other woman or another woman rather than to come together in an act of solidarity with the other women and say, let's bust this game, you know, let's bust the game that gives us the lesser number of seats around the table. And so I think that is implanted in us at the moment and a whole set of behaviours between women are the outworkings of that. And so the lesson of the book or the message of the book is, you know, if you're climbing in your career, you know, you might hit a moment like that where you do run against another woman. But even as you're doing it, have, think through what could I be doing as well or instead that would help bust open the rules of this game so we're not ultimately and always pitched against each other. How important then is this book in trying to bust that open or trying to rewire all of us and all of the internalised sexism we walk around with? I mean, you're a feminist, I'm a feminist, I know lots of women identify as feminists. That doesn't mean we don't have internalised sexism that we carry around. How do you reprogram and how, how much was that sort of a part of the agenda setting of your book that you wanted to do to try and make us rewire ourselves? It, it was a big part. I mean, this is, um, you know, we're very clear in Gozi and I about our perspectives in this. I mean, uh, you know, I I am someone who across a lifetime um, has uh, looked at power structures and has, want, has wanted to see women come through in equal numbers and be able to bring their feminism uh, to those power structures. So I didn't, I didn't go into the federal parliament to say, let's completely change this place and just make it kind and gentle and instead of having question time, we'll all hold hands and we'll, um, you know, commune until we get an outcome for the nation. That wasn't me. I went into an adversarial structure to show that women could dominate it. Um, and so uh, particularly that, you know, ritualised a daily event of question time, or at least when Parliament's sitting and we're not in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you know, other feminists very much want to change power structures. And so any dialogue to them about getting women to the top is sort of missing um, the, the biggest bit. So, you know, this is a book about power structures and how we bring women's lives, perspectives and women in equal numbers to the top of those power structures. Um, so having said that, in that context, it is a book about how do we rewire ourselves and those structures. And um, I'm a very big believer that the first step to fixing any problem is shining a light on it and talking about it. And that's the contribution that I hope the book can make. It can shine the light and force the conversation. When you were Prime Minister, you were always a feminist and you were always really open about that. But I feel like since you left office, you've been able to be your best feminist self and <laughs> talk about it differently. Uh, did you feel, and this is a personal question, I've only been asked versions of it before because I watched all your interviews, I would. Did you feel constrained about owning that or being too aggressive or assertive about feminism and women's leadership? It wasn't so much that I felt constrained when I was Prime Minister as I didn't see the need for it the way I see the need for it now. So, I mean, we talked earlier about... Sorry? What's changed to go... There is really urgent need, because the word urgent is in your book. Urgent is... Yes. You know, yes. There's a sense of urgency around this. Oh, yeah, look, I... Um, I mean, I think the, the difference is when, when I was Prime Minister, a bit like when I was a young woman, I kind of happily assumed uh, that uh, I'd get to have most of my career in a gender equal world, and I was wrong about that. When I was Prime Minister, particularly in the early part, I assumed that the maximum interest in me being the first woman and the maximum differential treatment would be in the early days of my prime ministership and then it would equalise out, you know, and it would always probably be there a bit but not at fever pitch. So I underestimated how the gendered insults, the gendered abuse would actually grow over time as the controversial circumstances of the government grew. And so by the time I was calling it out, um, it was very easy for people to say, 
oh, she's only saying that because the government's in so much trouble on carbon pricing, or she's only saying that because, you know, she's got uh, internal difficulties in the Labor Party or whatever. Um, so with the, with the benefit of hindsight, I think I missed the best moment to raise it. Um, and having um, uh, fall, fallen for the, the happy card twice, you know, as a young woman, it's all going to be fine when you're older. No. Uh, as a new Prime Minister, it's all going to sort of wash its way through the system. No. Um, I'm not going to fall for the happy card third time round. You know, this is only going to happen uh, if we really, really push. And that's where the sense of urgency comes from. Just... And I'm going a little over time, I'm a bit naughty like that, but just on the, the the idea that's been raised and explored, I know you've been thinking about this, about whether women leaders have been managing the pandemic better because we're in an unprecedented crisis. It's a cliche, but it's true. That's what this is. Uh, I know, you know, there's no science yet or the survey's not big enough to say we're certain women have done a better job, but... Is there anything in that, that that the women leaders, you know, if you look at Germany, for instance, where we talk about Angela Merkel, or if you look at New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, there is there has been really good management of of what is a crisis in, in health and also the economy. I think uh, all of the research constraints that you've spoken about are absolutely right. You know, sample size isn't big enough, other factors not controlled for, you know, uh, uh, New Zealand, obviously, uh, an island, smaller country, places like Norway with Ernest Solberg, one of the richest countries in the world. So, you know, you, you can't kind of get too precise on this. But I almost think it's easier to think of it in the converse, which is, what I reckon you can definitely say is the stereotypical bulldoze through bluster force of personality um, style of leadership that a number of leading men in the world have been able to kind of get away with in other circumstances. Um, it's met its match with the coronavirus, that style of leadership, because it's not interested in your bluster, it's not going to give way to your bulldozing. Um, it is what it is. And if you're not listening to the science and you're not responding to the science, then you end up as, you know, President Bolsonaro in Brazil and you've got the COVID-19 yourself and the death rates in your country are truly extraordinary. Um, so, you know, we're kind of baking the sexism here in, in some ways in this conversation, but if we, um, say, if you were bringing the stereotypes to bear and saying that is the sort of ultra macho style of leadership, it has certainly come a cropper in this era, whilst people have been warming to the strength and empathy that get associated with female styles of leadership. It will be interesting to see on this discussion when we're beyond the phase of the health crisis um, if you imagine the health crisis is abating, maybe we get a vaccine or something, uh, but there's uh, something that helps us return the world to something more like normal. Um, but there is still the acute economic crisis. It will be interesting to see then what styles of leadership are being lauded when we're on to something that traditionally has been seen as a sort of uh, male domain. You know, when pollsters uh, characterise up areas of government policy, uh, they often talk about daddy issues and mummy issues and the, the economy has always been a daddy issue. Uh, health more a mummy issue where nurturing and empathy is more valued. So it will be fascinating to see what we're talking about in terms of leadership in the year to come. Can we expect more writing on, on women, uh, not just leadership, but feminism from you? Is this, is this kind of perhaps the, the future for Julia Gillard? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's certainly going to be part of my future in this sense. Uh, I chair the Global... I know you know the word, but I mean the actual writing too, the, the, us being able to read it. Yes, uh, well, I, I will continue to be at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, King's College London. We're opening a sister institute at the Australian National University. So you'll see me well and truly popping up with um, research I haven't done, but um, uh, I'm part of helping communicate into the hands of people who can use it. Uh, whether I'll write again, look, I haven't um, decided yet. I like writing. I enjoyed writing my first book. I've enjoyed writing this book, which is a very different experience, a co-author 
author, interview style, research base. Um, so I wouldn't rule it out. I'll have to have a think about it <laughs> and recover yeah, from right. the of this one because, as you know, they're very big efforts. So uh, you need a little bit of uh, recovery time in between, I think. And I just have to ask, do you sometimes rewatch the misogyny speech just, you know, to fire yourself up if you're in a sort of low mood or something? Is it something? Because I know a lot of women do, but for real, like women I know. Is it something you just go, oh, I might just uh, get onto YouTube and see, see how that no, <laughs> no, I don't. Um, uh, I think it's it's a bit like um, it's a bit like unveiling my portrait in Parliament House. I can be very happy to be there for the unveiling. I can be absolutely delighted uh, at uh, Vincent Fantuzzo's work, but I'm glad it's in Parliament House, not in my family home. I think <laughs> I think I would have the same reaction to tiling up the misogyny speech on YouTube. It's a great speech, though. It must be one of your proudest moments. Yeah, I mean, it's um, look, it, it, it is. Uh, it is. I'm I'm sort of in a zone with that now. For a while, um, for a while, I kind of almost resented the way it was flattening everything else. You know, it, it would be the one thing everybody'd want to talk to you about, and you think, oh yeah, and I was in politics for 15 years. I was prime minister for three. I was deputy prime minister for three. We got a few things done, um, you know, and everybody wants to talk about the one speech. Um, but I'm sort of at peace with it now, and um, certainly internationally, you know, most people don't know much about Australian politics, and yet uh, many people know that speech. So that does make me proud if they associate Australia, kangaroos, koalas, misogyny speech. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Hang on, this quiet, listen to the misogyny speak. I reckon that's pretty good. Now, Julie Gillard, you've been such a delightful guest and, um, I'm, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of the day reading the book too um, because I'm in lockdown in Melbourne. I know you've got a bit more movement, don't you, with your life. How are you going at the moment with the pandemic before I say goodbye to you? Uh, I'm, I'm going well. I've actually um, coming to the end of 14 days of self-isolation, which is the price I paid for going to New South Wales. Uh, and South Australia's uh, taking a very uh, cautious, uh, appropriate and cautious approach to all of this. So I went for my mandatory day 12 COVID test yesterday and tested negative. So I'm all good. Winning. How was the test with the thing up your nose? Was it okay? Uh, it's it's the first time I've had one, um, so uh, I, I must admit I I got I pumped it up in my mind. <laughs> you know, I was thinking like I, I'm, I might have quite a large nose that way, but I've got quite a fine nose that way. I was thinking, oh my god, I think this is going to really hurt. But no, it didn't hurt at all. They did <laughs> they did it very gently and well. And you know, I didn't think I had a huge risk um, having just been to Sydney, but always good to get a negative result. Absolutely. Now, the book is called Women and Leadership. I'm holding it because I love props. Uh, it is available on the Melbourne Writers Festival online bookshop. I urge people to get a copy and I know uh, people will all want to be thanking you or watching this in this weird world. We usually be in a room, Julia Gillard, there'll be people in the room, you'd be signing books. It would be a wonderful event. We're doing it differently and we appreciate your time uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia.